Hi everybody, this is the first video for Chem 263. Today's topic is going to be all about electrophilic aromatic substitution. To begin with, I wanted to review a reaction that we saw last term. Last term we saw that alkenes, like cyclohexene, can do addition reactions with something like a halogen, where you can add, in this example, two bromines across a pi bond. And if you remember, the bromines are going to add anti to one another. So one bromine will be a wedge, the other one will be a dash, and in this example we'll end up with a mixture of enantiomers. And what that means is the top bromine could be a dash and the lower bromine would be a wedge. It is important to remember though that they will be anti. All right, so this reaction was really straightforward. We saw the mechanism last term, so we won't go over that again. But what I wanted to do is to compare this to another situation. And in this second situation, we have benzene. If we try to do the same reaction with benzene using elemental bromine, the reaction doesn't work. So I'm just going to write no reaction. Some students will be tempted to say, well, there's a double bond in benzene, so why is it not possible to get something like this, where you get addition across one of those pi bonds and then a mixture of enantiomers? So why doesn't this reaction work? Let's come up with a list of reasons why this doesn't work. So reasons why the lower reaction fails. All right, so the first reason I would say is the double bonds in benzene, meaning this molecule down here, aren't true alkenes, right? If we think about those double bonds in benzene, they're more like a bond and a half due to resonance, right? Those double bonds can go around the entire ring. So let's make a note of that. We'll just say the double bonds in benzene have resonance. and are not true alkenes. Another way of thinking about this is the double bonds in benzene have a bond order of 1.5, meaning they're a bond and a half, where an alkene has a bond order of two. All right, so I'd say that's one really good reason. Another good reason is that we would have to break aromaticity in benzene to form our product. So another way of thinking about that is up here, we started out with an aromatic molecule, benzene, and if this reaction were to occur, we would create a product that has no aromaticity. Okay. Would require breaking aromaticity leading to a less stable product. In order for a reaction to be spontaneous, we typically are gonna make a product that is more stable than our starting material, right? Otherwise, the reaction just simply wouldn't occur. So that's one reason. Another reason we could say is that the double bonds in the aromatic ring aren't very good nucleophiles, again, due to resonance. So I would say that this kind of summarizes why the reaction shown above fails. We really have this unique situation where the double bonds in aromatic rings don't behave like normal um, alkenes. So I wanted to show you another problem slash weird example. And this weird situation involves adding in iron. So if we try the reaction above and we treat it with elemental bromine and we add in some iron, all of a sudden we get a new product out. And this new product has a bromine that is replacing one of the hydrogen atoms in the aromatic ring. So it's a little bit different than the top example. 
right? In the top example, we started out with an aromatic molecule, and we said that there was no reaction because we would have to break aromaticity to form our theoretical product. In this bottom situation, you might notice that we're starting out with an aromatic molecule, and we're ending with an aromatic molecule. So this is kind of unique. Really all that's happening is we're swapping out a hydrogen for some other element, in this case, bromine. So what this is referred to as is electrophilic aromatic substitution. Meaning we're substituting the hydrogen for a bromine atom. I like to just refer to this as an EAS reaction. It's a lot quicker to write that down. All right, so now we need to investigate why this iron that we add in all of a sudden allows this reaction to occur where we can actually make some new product out of the starting material. All right, so let's go ahead and investigate this in more detail. Let's first write down the overall reaction and then we'll kind of theorize what's going on here. So overall, what's occurring is we're treating this with Br2, but when you mix Br2 with iron, you actually form a compound called iron 3 bromide. So that's FeBr3. Like I said, this occurs when you mix iron and elemental bromine. So if you say iron plus three equivalents of elemental bromine, you make two equivalents of FeBr3, that iron 3 tribromide. So really that's what's in solution that's helping out. And we're making a product where bromine is replacing one of the hydrogen atoms that was coming off of that aromatic ring. All right, so let's look at a proposed mechanism and figure out what's going on here. What's going on is we have the iron tribromide, which if we think about it laying on its side, would be trigonal planar. So I'm gonna draw it kind of like this. And it has a vacant p orbital, right? So it's important to remember that this iron tribromide is sp2 and it's got an empty p orbital hanging off of it. So we've got this empty p orbital and we know that empty p orbitals really, really, really want electrons. In this case, it's not gonna get the electrons from the aromatic ring. Instead, it's going to get it from the elemental bromine. All right, so the electrons are gonna go from the elemental bromine into the empty p orbital of the iron tribromide. If you remember way back to last term, any sort of compound that accepts an electrons is referred to as a Lewis acid. And over here, the bromine must be our Lewis base because it's donating electrons. All right, so the product that forms out of this looks a little bit unusual. So let's draw it out. And the bromine in this case, because it gained electrons, is gonna have a negative charge. The bromine that donated electrons will have a positive charge. And if we think about the dipole in this situation, this bromine with the positive charge is really unhappy. It does not like having that positive charge. So it's gonna pull electron density away from this neighboring bromine right next door, which means that this bromine atom right here is very electrophilic. It wants electrons because the electron density is being hogged by the bromine next door. Okay, so at this point, the aromatic molecule has just enough electron density 
to donate to that bromine. So what's going to happen is it's going to donate its electron density to that bromine atom, and then we're going to break this bond to the next door neighbor bromine. All right, so let's take a look at what happens here. So we've got this aromatic molecule. It's going to steal that bromine. However, there's still a hydrogen coming off of there. And over here, we still have a hydrogen down here. So let's just keep track of these two hydrogens. Or if you even want to, let's draw in all of them. And let's also keep track of where our double bonds are. So we know that there's a double bond here and here. They were untouched. But we know that the double bond that's right here was actually used in that reaction, right? So those electrons form the new covalent bond to bromine right there. Okay, so we're missing something though. We're missing a charge. And in this case, the charge must be on this lower carbon right there. All right, so what this compound is referred to, or I should say this intermediate, is a sigma complex. Some books will also refer to this as an arenium ion. You may notice that it's no longer aromatic, right? So we have broken aromaticity in this product or in this intermediate, which means it's highly, highly, highly unstable. But that's okay because we still have this iron complex floating around. So we still have the iron and the four bromines the iron in this case still has a negative charge. That was really what was left over up here at that step. So we still have that floating around. And we know that the bromine in this case off the iron complex can actually be used as a really weak base. So what's gonna happen is this bromine is going to grab the proton right there and it's going to collapse down and reform that pi bond. Okay, so at the end here, what we have is a new pi bond. We've got our bromine right here. We still have our other pi bonds and all of the other hydrogens. You're welcome to show them if you want. And we've regenerated our iron tribromide. So the fact that this was regenerated means that it's catalytic. So it's kind of neat that this reaction will work with iron. What's really happening here is we're using the iron to form a Lewis acid catalyst that's regenerated at the end of the reaction. And then our only byproduct here is going to be HBr. Okay, so I did wanna show you a couple other situations. So let's do some other examples. All right, so the one we just saw used benzene, and we said that we could use Br2 and FeBr3 to install a single bromine atom. However, there are other Lewis acid catalysts you can use as well. The key thing is they all must have an empty p orbital. So we could do Br2 and AlBr3, that's aluminum three bromide. And this reaction will still work. Additionally, you can do this reaction with chlorine and normally with chlorine, you'll see Cl2 used, so that's chlorine gas. And then normally what people use is aluminum trichloride. So this reaction will work with chlorine as well. Really the overall mechanism is entirely similar. So you don't need to worry about um, showing it separately. It's gonna follow the exact same Mechanism, mechanism that we've covered here. We're just gonna swap out that iron for an aluminum and the bromines for chlorines. All right, so that's pretty neat. Um, 
the question is, well, why is this useful? So let's finish up talking about that. So why is this useful? All right. So the main reason that this is useful is now we can start functionalizing aromatic molecules and building things off of them. So for example, I could add in elemental bromine and iron tribromide. I could install a bromine atom off of an aromatic ring, thereby functionalizing it. And then what I could do is I could toss in that magnesium metal I can make my Grignard reagent. And as we saw last term, Grignard reagents are incredibly useful. I could treat this with an aldehyde. And if I treat it with an aldehyde, I would get an alcohol. I could treat it with a ketone. I could treat it with an ester or I could treat it with an epoxide. We saw how to do this a bunch last term, so we can use this to quickly functionalize aromatic molecules. One thing I did want to show that's a big problem is a lot of times students will say, well, why can't we do a reaction with a nucleophile and do substitution chemistry off of here? The reality is, this will not work. Why won't it work? Well, if we remember our SN2 chemistry, we cannot do SN2 reactions on an sp2 hybridized carbon. So this is sp2, which means that no SN2 can occur. So really the best approach once you do halogenation is to turn it into a Grignard reagent and then have it ring open an epoxide or attack into some sort of carbonyl compound like an ester, ketone, or an aldehyde. All right, so that's where we'll stop for today's topic. I'll make a video a little later where we look at sulfonation and nitration that I would like you to complete as well.